Do you have enemies? Do you have people who try to hurt you? That try to harm you? That try to curse you? How do you respond when your enemies come at you? When they're trying to tear you down? How do you respond? How do you treat them? What do you do? Do you retaliate in the manner in which they've come to you? Do you try to blow them off like they really don't exist? Do you try to pretend that you don't have any enemies at all? There's a story about a man that was 100 years old. There was a big celebration he had made 100 years old. It was a big party. There was a reporter there, a reporter there. What's the, uh, your proudest achievement of being 100 years old? He says, being 100 years old, I don't have any enemies. And that reporter said, wow, man, that's great, great. How did that come about? And then the man responds and said, I have outlived all of my enemies. Are you trying to outlive all your enemies, not really deal with the situation? Well, the question is, how does Jesus want us to deal with our enemies? In our passage today, it says, love your enemies. And we're going to find out what that looks like. Stay tuned for this week's lesson. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III. I am bringing you this week's Sunday School lesson for October 11th, 2020. The title of the lesson is called Love Your Enemies. We'll look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. Love your enemies. Before we get started to our lesson, as it is my custom, I need your help. I need you to help me with a particular matter. I would like for this broadcast to reach as many people as possible. So I need for you to hit the like button, hit the share button, and then if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified for every time I put out a lesson or put out a sermon. I would like for this to reach as many people as possible, but I can't do it without your help. So I thank you in advance. So let's get into this uh, week's lesson, Love Your Enemies. We're dealing with Luke chapter 6. Let's deal with the setting, what is happening. Uh, Jesus is speaking to a great crowd. A great crowd has followed him. Uh, Jesus is early in his ministry. He's doing a lot of healing. Uh, he's doing a lot of... Um, feeding a lot of miracles, and people are following him uh, to receive that and to hear his word. And so in Math Matthew chapter 5, we have the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to these large crowds on a mount of some sort, high up, looking down. But in this passage here, we look at Luke chapter 17, Jesus has come down from this mount He's on the plane on the same level as the people, and he is speaking to them. So this is called the Sermon on the Plain because Jesus is no longer on the mount. He's on a plain level with those who he is speaking to. And he's speaking to a large crowd. In that large crowd, there are your customary Pharisees and scribes, your naysayers, those who are against Jesus. And then there's a large number of disciples, those who are decided to follow Jesus. And then you have the apostles. So in this large crowd, that's the mix up. That's who he is speaking to. And so in this crowd, uh, again, they have come to hear his teachings, but they also have come to be cured of unclean spirits, demon possession, and any type of diseases that they have. And so they come from all over and he is speaking. So he starts off in verse 20, what is called the Beatitudes. These Beatitudes are very similar to what Matthew talks about, but this is a different discourse. It's not the same discourse. And so he is talking about what it is to be a kingdom man or woman. Uh, he's talking about those who belong in the kingdom. He says followers or disciples of his 
are the only ones belonging to the kingdom. So he is really speaking this message here, the Beatitudes, to those who have decided to follow him, those who are committed to him, those who are disciples of him. And so he tells them, blessed those who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. He's telling them, this is where you are now. You may be poor now, but you got something to look forward to. Blessed those who are hungry, you shall be satisfied. You may be uh, hungry now as far as spiritually, but you will be satisfied. Blessed are those who weep now, you shall laugh. You may be having hard times now, but there will become a time in the kingdom where you will be laughing. So he's telling the, uh, the disciples what they have to look forward to, that their situation will not last forever. Better things are coming. Now, verse 22 tells us that what Jesus is talk, saying and who he is talking to, and that includes our passage, are those who are going to be persecuted for this account of being a disciple of the Son of Man or being a follower of Jesus. Look what he says here. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and spurn your name as evil. What he said is that blessed are you. That's a good thing for the follower, a good thing for a disciple of mine. When you are blessed when people are doing that because that means you're doing the right thing. You're living the life. You're evangelizing. You're sharing. You're doing all those things. And when you do all those things, if you are a follower of mine, if you're a disciple of mine, you can't expect to be hated. You can't expect people to revile you. You can't expect people to spur your name as evil for my sake. See, right now we have a lot of Christians who are not going through that. Uh, there are a lot of Christians who are undercover Christians, who are secret Christians. Uh, they claim to believe in Christ, but no one else knows it. They claim to believe in Christ, but nobody can see that they are a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a believer in God by their actions or by what comes out of their mouth. So in other words, they're Christians, but they're not being persecuted. They're Christians, but no one knows. They're Christians when it's comfortable for them. And what Jesus is saying here is that if you're doing my will, if you are the kingdom of God, and you are a follower of mine, disciple of mine, this is what you will, this is what you can't expect. This is what will happen to you when you uh, share my teachings, when you share the gospel, when you share the good news, when you try to live right, this is what you can expect. But he also tells them this, that by doing this and by having these things happen to you, blessed are you or happy are you because there's a reward for you. Not just a reward. Jesus says there is a great reward. Your reward is great in heaven. So Jesus is encouraging uh, the disciples, not just the 12 disciples, but all the disciples, those who have decided to follow him, that if you can endure, live for me, do what is right, live for the kingdom, be a kingdom man or woman, a child of God, guess what? Endure the hardships and the frustration, all the harm that will come your way, all the bad words that will come your way. If you can do all that, you have a great reward in heaven. So he's giving them encouragement. And then Jesus in 24 turns into those who are not following him. And he has a message for them. He says, woe to you who are rich. So for you have received your consolation. You have gotten what you're going to get. It won't get any better than what you have right now. In fact, the day you die, it will get worse. Woe to you who are full now. You shall be hungry. You have all that you want, but there will come a time you will be hungry. There will be come a time when judgment comes. Guess what? You will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You laugh now, you think you're doing well now. There will be a time where you'll have so much regret, you will weep and mourn. That's when Jesus comes. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. You think you're getting all the accolades now? People are speaking good of you to be a time. Well, that will not help you at all. You better enjoy it right now. So now in verse 27, this is our passage. And Jesus starts off by saying, but I say to you who hear, 
He has gone to speak to the disciples, those who are following him. He's gone to speak to those who are uh, not following him. And now he comes back to speak to those who are his disciples. And this message is for the apostles and for all the other disciples who are following him, who are of the kingdom of God. And he says, but I say to you who hear, the Pharisees are not going to be able to hear what he says. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the Beatitudes. They don't understand the pronouncements of the woes. They don't get it. But those who are his followers or disciples, the apostles, they understand. So he says, but I say to you who hear, who hear, understand. And look what he says. He's going to say something that's going to shock the world. Who's going to shock all those who hear. Love your enemies. To me and you, we've heard it before, but in that day and time, to love your enemies was crazy, was, was unheard of, was not even thought of, what he, what he, didn't even think about it. And let me tell you why. In Leviticus 19.18, Moses wrote a passage, and it talks about vengeance is of the Lord. Do not take vengeance against your fellow man. He says, to love your neighbors. This was done in Leviticus. And from that time of Leviticus, when that was written, to now, that commandment by God got watered down. The only thing they could remember was to love your neighbor. They could not remember the part says, let God handle any kind of vengeance. Let God handle any kind of retribution. Let God handle it for you. Do not take matters into your own hands. Do not do evil for evil. They forgot all of that. Only thing they remembered was to love your neighbor. And so what happened was they were all, their culture was, I'm only going to love my neighbor. I'm going to love those who look like me. I'm only going to love fellow Jews. I'm going to love those who, who uh, think the way I do. Uh, if you're a Gentile, I'm not going to love you. If you're a Roman, I'm not going to love you. Uh, and so they only love their own kind and their own culture. And to them, a neighbor was somebody that they liked and looked like them. And so, but they have forgot about the vengeance part. How do you know that? If you go to Matthew chapter 5, 43, when Jesus is given the beatitude recorded by Matthew, it's, and it, Jesus says, for it is said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. So that Leviticus 19.18 had got watered down because of hardship, because of oppression by the Roman government, oppression by their enemies, mistreatment by the rich, uh, mistreatment by other Jews, mistreatment by the tax collectors, mistreated by the zealots, mistreated by those who didn't follow Judaism, mistreated, people got mistreated, so they forgot all about the vengeance part leading that to God, they remembered the the uh, love your neighbor, and then they, they kind of adopted the fact that you ought to love your neighbor and hate your enemies. And so up until this point, they were loving their neighbors, those who thought like them, looked like them, were uh, lived with them, and they hated everybody else. Anybody that hurt them, anybody that spoke out against them, any, anybody that harmed them, anybody that did anything against them, they hated them. And so right now, what Jesus is doing now, he's trying to do what in theological terms is called the great reversal. He's trying to change their heart. He's trying to change their way of thinking. He's trying to, to get them back to Levit Leviticus 19.18, where the original word was, and the original word was correct. He's trying to do a paradigm shift. He's trying to help them out. He's trying to tell them that you are, since you're a follower of mine, if you're a follower of mine, you have to understand the great reversal. You have to understand what's expected of you as it relates to your enemies. And what he's telling them, you can't go around hating anybody, not even your enemies. And he's going to tell them that even your enemy is your neighbor. Even that person you don't like, you detest is your enemy. He's going to, that's what he's saying. So when he said love your enemies, their ears perked up. They said, what in the world is he talking about? 
The Pharisees and the scribes, they probably were going crazy. What is this man asking us to do? How can we love our enemies? And Jesus said, if you are a kingdom man or woman, this is what you do. You love your enemies. And he's going to explain why that's important. He says, now who are your enemies? He said, to do good to those who hate you. Those who hate you are your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Those who curse you are your enemies. Pray to those who abuse you. Those who abuse you are your enemies. That's the definition. These are practical examples of what an enemy is. Someone who wants to cause harm to you. They're going to hate you, do things against you. They're going to curse you. They're going to speak ill of you, wish harm on you, and they're going to abuse you. They're going to mistreat you. So he says, do good to those who hate you. Those who want bad things to happen to you. Those who want to harm you. Do good means to be compassionate. Do kind actions to those who hate you. In other words, what he's saying that you don't return hate with hate. Not if you're in my kingdom. Not if you're a follower of mine. You don't return hate with hate. You return hate with good. And their mind, their mind is saying, well, that I hate with hate. That's what I've been doing. How do you expect me to return good with good? Well, you, you can. You can. And so the issue, let me go back to love your enemies. That word love has four definitions. It could be the uh, eros or erotic type of love, that sexual kind of love. It could be the phileo type of love that deals with fellowship. It could be what's called the storage, S-T-O-R-A-G-E, type of love that deals with a, affection. But this love right here, it deals with the agape type of love. You're saying, how can I do this? You can't do it if you're having all the other three loves. If you interpret this as the erotic love, no, you cannot lo love your enemies. If you interpret it as a phileo love, fellowship, no, you, you, not, you don't have it in you to love, to, to the fellowship to love, the, to, love, to love your enemies. If you have the um, storage type, the affection type, no, you can't do it. You have to have the agape love. That's what he's talking about. Agape love is that is the unconditional type of love. I love you now no matter what, no matter what you do to me, no matter how much you hate me, no matter how much you curse me, no matter how much you hit me, whatever you do, I'm going to love you anyway because agape love is an act of the will. It's the other ones are based on emotion. The agape love, is based on the will. In other words, you make your mind up to do something. I'm going to love you no matter what you do to me. Even though you've done some stuff to me in the past, I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to continue to love you forever and ever because that's who I am and that's what Christ wants to do and I make up my mind to do is the act of the will. Act of the volition. It's an act of the will. That's why you can do it. But if you get emotional about this type of love or you look at it from the wrong spectrum, you will never able to do it. A sexual kind of love cannot love their enemies. A, a, a love that's affection oriented cannot do that because it'll be you're only going to show affection when affection is given to you. You're not going to show affection to a hateful person, but a person who has that agape love will be able to love their enemies at all times and all circumstances. So do good to those who hate you because I have those agape love. Make up your mind to do good to those who hate you. Kind actions. Compassion to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. In other words, when somebody curses you, you don't return curse words back to them or wish evil upon them, you speak good words to them. No matter how bad they're talking about you, you in turn speak good words to them. You got to remember that how we act as Christians can lead people to Christ or to pull people away from Christ. If we go about life responding in like manner, in like kind, to the way the people that our enemies respond to us, will never ever lead anybody to Christ. They will ever, never ever know you're a child of God. They will never ever see Christ in you. And so we have to practice the great reversal. We replace hate with good, kind actions, compassionate actions. That's going to 
that's going to confuse the world. They're going to say, what in the world is going on? I, ha I hate him, but yet he loves me and does kind actions for me. That's going to convict them. What in the world is going on? I I'm wishing harm on this individual. I'm wishing that God would bring down brimstone on this individual, but yet this individual is blessing me, speaks good of me. I heard it was said that, that, you know, why would you speak good of somebody who wishes curses of you? Why would you bless somebody? Well, the answer is that may be their opinion of me, but that's not my opinion of them. So just because somebody is speaking bad about you doesn't give you the right to speak bad about them. If you are a child of God, if you are a kingdom man or woman, guess what? You will bless that individual. So bless those who curse you. Guess what? Pray for those who abuse you, those who mistreat you. The world says when somebody mistreats you, you mistreat them back. Look at our political environment today. Everything's tit for tat. You do this to me, I get that back to you. You lie on me, I lie on you. You do this to me, I do this to you. You try to hurt me, I try to hurt you. That's not the way kingdom people do. Kingdom people says when someone uh, abuses me or mistreats me, instead of me retaliating or taking vengeance, I do what is called the great reversal. I pray for that individual. That's what I do. I pray I don't retaliate. I pray I don't hate. I pray I don't curse. In fact, I do the exact opposite of what they're doing to me. I don't run away. I don't pretend like it never happened. I don't, I don't try to play it down. No, I take action. I do the exact reversal of what was done to me. I take action. So when someone hates you, do a kind word. Do kind, kind action toward them. When someone uh, curses you, say good things about that individual. When someone mistreats you, pray for that individual. That, that's the great reversal. We are kingdom men and women, those who claim to be followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, who claim to have Christ living in their hearts. We are kingdom men and women. Kingdom men and women are called to a higher standard than the rest of the world. We are called to do the great reversal. When someone does something bad to us, we do the exact opposite. Because that's who we are. That's what agape love is. And that's what Jesus is saying here. That you're following me? This is what you got to do. Because later on, or as Jesus lived out his ministry, he did the exact same thing. Those who heard him, he responded back in love. Those who hated him, he responded back in curse and kind and uh in kind actions, those who cursed him, he blessed them. Those who abused him, he prayed for them. So he is not asking you or me to do anything that he has not done. And so we gotta live that great reversal. And that great reversal is called to love your enemies. So then he says, gives a further example. These are, I think these are our extreme examples to make sure we get his point that we are not to uh, have vengeance against our enemies. We are not to try to hurt our enemies because they have hurt us. Look what he says here. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, I mean someone who hits you in the fist really hard, or someone who slaps your face, or someone who insults you, offer the other one also. What we have to understand and what we have to do is that when someone harms us, as if hitting us in the face or insulting us, how can we best respond in love? What's the best way to respond that will show them that we are a kingdom man and woman of God? What's the best way to respond to reflect who we are in Christ? What's the best way to respond to show that we have the love of Christ abiding in us? So what Jesus says here, when someone does the extreme thing of hitting in the cheek, Turn the other cheek. Don't try to fight back. Don't try to take them down. Don't hire a hit man. Don't do any of those things. Turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate. Try to find out the best way that you can show love to that individual. That's what he's saying. He's using an extreme example to get his point across. Look what he says also here. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Someone steals from you. Someone robs you. Yeah, you can take them to court. 
Yeah, you can try to get it back, but maybe the best thing to do is let them have it. Not only let them have it, but give them some more clothes to wear. Show them additional love. Uh, show them that you really care. Do the, the, the great reversal. Instead of uh, going to the authorities, you find that individual, ask them what their needs are. How can I help you? You need more clothes? Let me give you more clothes. Let me tell you about the love of Christ. Let me witness to you. Let me share to you how you can have peace and enjoyment living down in this chaotic world. Let me meet your need by giving you more. Find a way where someone has robbed you to show them the love of Christ. To show them love that goes over and beyond what's expected of you. That will emulate the great reversal that Jesus is talking about here. Loving your enemies. Then it says here, give to everyone who begs from you. Give to everyone who begs. If you're walking by, and you see someone begging. Christians ought to be the most generous people here on earth. You have uh, sinners that give, but Christians ought to be the most generous. Christians cannot walk by, see someone in a genuine need and not do something about it. Now, are you to give to everybody who's in need? Maybe not. But if God has laid it on your heart and you see that that person has a real need, then maybe you should give something and give generously. I'm not saying give to the point where you're enabling that person. Are you actually hurting that person by your giving? But guess what? If, you, if God has convicted you and you know there's a need, what Jesus is saying here, the kingdom men and women give generously. They don't look the other way. They don't snub their nose. They don't talk about that individual. They reach inside their pocket and they give. Give to everyone who begs from you. Don't ridicule them. Don't say they should have, they should, it's their fault that they're way. That's, that's irrelevant. What's relevant, they have a need. You see that need. Kingdom men and women do the reversal. They respond to that need by being a generous giver. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Someone takes something from you. Let them have it. Let them have it. There's a story about a man who was witnessing to these teens and his, his record player got stolen. Did he like it? No. But what he did was he didn't say a word because if he may have said a word, then those teens wouldn't be coming back to his house and he would have lost a chance to witness to them. In other words, what Jesus is saying there, sometimes, even though you have the right to, to go legal on somebody, sometimes it's not right to go legal. Sometimes it's best to just leave it alone so that you can keep witnessing and keep that person or those people around you so you can share the love of Christ. And by doing that, you will be showing that I love my enemies. I have loved someone who have harmed me. The, the common person would have said, get out of my house, don't invite them back. They stole from me, blah, blah, blah. But the great reversal is, to absorb that loss and keep witness to them. Says, and, and let me give you an example. We know about Balcom John and Anger Geiger. And this lady named uh, Geiger, she, you know what happened. I'm not going to get into all that. But at the end of the trial, he asked for a hug from her. And he gave asked for a, a, a hug from Amber Geiger. And that was a great reversal. No one saw that coming. No one expected it. That's like here saying love your enemies. Why would a young man who this woman killed his older brother want a hug from her? He was showing his love for her. I'm loving my enemy. I'm loving someone who has harmed me. I love someone who has taken something away from me. I'm showing the grace and mercy of God. I'm showing who I am. That's one of the greatest examples of what kingdom men and do, the great reversal. The world says, do this, hate this person, want her to get life, want her to have 25, 30 years. But the great reversal has compassion and has love. I'm going to show her love, and I hope there's a way that the court would have mercy and compassion on her. That's what Jesus is talking about, and that's what this man displayed by hugging Amber Geiger. 
Look at 39, 31, excuse me. This is the golden rule, as you would say. It says, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. In other words, treat people as you want them to treat you. It didn't say treat people like they treat you. You treat people as you would want them to treat you. A lot of people go by the other rule. I'm only going to treat them the way they treat me. You nice to me, I'll be nice to you. You speak well of me, I speak well of you. Uh, they may say uh, uh, if you if I am walking by and and so and so didn't speak to me. Well, because they didn't speak to me, I'm not going to speak to them. That is childish. That's immature. That's not what kingdom men and women do. Kingdom when men and women say. Although that person won't speak to me or every time I walk by will not speak to me, I will make sure I speak to her. Not only will I make sure I speak to her, I will attempt to give her a hug. Not only will I speak to her and give her a hug, I will ask that person how they're doing. I will go over and beyond what is expected of me to show them the love of Christ. I will love my enemies. I will do the great reversal. If more Christians would do that, more people who said they were followers of Christ, we would have more peace in this world. People would get along better. More people would come to Christ. And so Jesus says here, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the golden rule. That's the big picture. If you've done something wrong to somebody, you would want them to show mercy to you, then show mercy. If you said something to somebody and you would want them not in turn to talk about you, but you would in turn want them to speak well of you, then that's what you need to do. Do unto others as they would, as you would have them do unto you. And if you live that rule, you are living the kingdom rule. Let's look what 32 says. 32 said, if you love those who you love, what benefit is that to you? You see that the Jews of this day, they only love people who love them. And that they only loved fellow Jews. They didn't love Roman officials, soldiers, people in Roman government. They didn't love the tax collector, Jews who were deemed to be a sellout. They didn't love the rich, who oppressed them. They only love people who love them. They only love people who treated them right. And that's the mistake they were making. And what Jesus is saying here, and, he, and what he explains, he says, for every, even sinners love those who love them. When you only love people who only love you, your family, your children, your mother and father, your siblings, your best friend, those people are easy to love. But can you love those who are hard to love? Which are your enemies. Can you love them? And Jesus said, if you're really doing that, if you're loving your enemies, you are really doing something. But if you only love those who love you, you're not doing anything at all. You're only doing what sinners do. You're only doing what normal people do. You're not doing anything that's going to attract the attention of anybody. And so what we as Christians got to do, we got to love anybody, whether they're Republican or Democrat, we have got to love them. Whether they're for Trump or for Biden, we have got to love them. And how do we love them? Do good and don't hate them. Don't curse them, but bless them. Don't mistreat people who disagree with you. Pray for them. We do the great reversal. The reason why our world is in the United States and the world is in the situation that it is now, too many people love their neighbor and hate their enemies. Too many people do bad to those who hate them. Too many people curse them who curse them. Too many people abuse them that, ab uh, uh, abuse them that have abused you. And what we need is that we need Christians to do the great reversal and love their enemies 
in the agape type of love, no matter who that person is, no matter what that person does, I'm going to love them. I'm going to do good to them. I'm going to speak well of them. And I'm going to pray for them. That's how you love people. And too many Christians have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We love them, people, we love the people in church, but we hate people outside of church. And that is wrong. We got too many Christians are divided over political party. When we have something greater that bonds us together, and that's the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ over supersedes any hate or any dislike we have for anybody. I'm not saying that you have to like everybody, but I am saying, and what Jesus is saying here, what the word of God is saying, you do have to love them if you're going to be a kingdom child of God. You don't have to like them. But you have to do something greater and love them. And that love that you have for them will supersede anybody that you dislike. For if you love those who love you, what benefit is that for you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good for those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Be only kind to those who are kind to you, how does that benefit you? If you see somebody on the road, you see somebody you like and you only somebody you dislike, and you only pick up or try to help out the person that you like, what benefit is that? The greater benefit for the kingdom of God is to do good to those who hate you. Because if you're only doing good to those who do good to you, you are no better than a sinner. It says, for even sinners do the same. A lot of people uh, just, they want to they do good to only those people who do good to you. That is, that is terrible. That is awful. That is unchristian. Look what else he says. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that from you? Let's say if somebody, you only lend to people that can pay you back. Even the sinners do the same thing. Lend to someone who may not be able to pay you back. Lend to someone who may struggle to pay you back. Lend to someone who really needs that loan from you. But if you're only lending to people or only helping out people who's going to pay you back, then what good are you really doing? What benefit are you really achieving? Even sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. We are called to do more than what the sinner does. And what Jesus is alluding to is that a lot of Christians live our lives just like the sinner does under their, their rules and not the golden rule. Not the golden rule. But love your enemies and do good. Love them, agape, make up your mind, act of the will. Do it without thinking. Don't let your emotions get involved. Do it until it becomes a habit. Do it unconditionally. But love your enemies and do good. Kind actions, show it. Let it be that people can see that you love that individual. And lend. Help out people. Expecting nothing in return. See, it's easy to do things for people when you respect something in return. I rub your back, you rub my back. I do this for you, you do this for me. That is not Christian. That is what sinners do. The real test is to help people out that can never, ever repay you. Give somebody some money that can never pay you back. Do a kind act for someone that can never do a kind act for you. Do good for somebody that can never do good for you. Do something for people and expect nothing in return. You're li then you're living like kingdom men and women. And look what Jesus says here again. 
and your reward will be great. And your reward will be great. God, through his grace and mercy, will reward you. Not that you're earning anything, but God will be pleased at what you're doing. And through his grace and mercy, he will reward you and it will be a great reward. That ought to give you a little incentive for doing what God expects you to do, which is to love your enemies. And you will be sons of the Most High. When you do these things, you will be giving proof or evidence that you are children of God, that you're disciples of Jesus, that you're followers of Jesus, that you belong to the kingdom. You will be sons and daughters of the Most High, of God the Father. That is an awesome thing. But this is how sons and daughters of the Most High live. They love their enemies. They live the great reversal one of the hardest things you ever have to do is, is, is live out being a Christian life. That is the hardest thing. It is not easy what God calls us to do, but it's doable because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that empowers us. It is durable. It's doable. It's doable. We just have to make up our minds that this is what we're going to do. We're going to follow Christ. We're going to live a life that is pleasing to God. It says, look, you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind and ungrateful to the evil. Why should we do all this? Why should we love our, our enemies? Because we'll, we'll be like God. We'll be doing what God wants us to do. Because God is kind to the ungrateful and evil. And you have to remember, you and I are the ungrateful and the evil. At one point in our life, we were ungrateful and we were evil. And God was kind to us by sending his son to die on the cross on our behalf so that when we believed, we become, became children of his. We were no longer ungrateful and evil in his eyes. But at one time we were. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could have wept out the whole earth and me and you would not have been born. But he did not. He was grateful to the ungrateful and evil. He was kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. We were evil. Adam and Eve became evil. Every offspring they had was evil. He could have wiped us out when Noah and the flood came. He didn't have to spare Noah. He could have killed Noah too. But he was kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. We don't have to wake up every day but every day, God is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. And guess what? Because he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. You and I, who claim to be followers of his, who claim to be part of his kingdom, have to be kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. That's what we're called to do. That's what he expect to, expects of us. Then what he says here, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus Christ came down just full of compassion. Could have not gone to the cross. Had every reason not to. But because of his mercy for us, because of his love for us, because of his kindness, he went to the cross. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. In other words, because your Father is compassionate, because He has shown compassion upon you, show compassion upon other people. We live in a world where too many Christians are spewing out hate. I hate Trump. I hate Biden. Trump is evil. Biden is evil. Uh, I want. I wish Trump was dead. I wish he would have died of the coronavirus. Uh, uh, Biden, I wish he was dead. We have people, Christians, spewing out hate, spewing out curses, 
spewing out uh, harm to individuals, not showing love. That ought not be that way. We have to stick to the issues at hand and speak to the issues. But we ought not let those things come out of our mouths. In other words, we should be praying for those who we think who have come. If you think Trump or Biden is causing harm to you, pray for him. If you think that Trump or Biden is lying, uh, pray for that. Pray for him. Instead of wishing that God would come down and, and do a, put a calamity on Trump or Biden, ask God to bless them. That's the great reversal. Too many times as Christians, we put our politics above our faith. When in reality, our faith should govern everything that we do and every action that we take. When we became Christians, we made a commitment to follow the word of God. We made a commitment to be kingdom men and women. And we have to do that. And whoever you consider your enemy, you ought to love them. If you consider Biden your enemy, love him in your action, in your words, in your prayers. If you consider Trump your enemy, love him in your actions, in your words, and in your prayers. When's the last time you've prayed for any one of these individuals? We know they both need prayer. Pray that God's will will be done. I'm not saying you have to like any of them. But I'm doing, I am saying you don't, you can't hate them. You have to love them, which supersedes any kind of like liking you have for them, which will compel you to do the right thing. If Christians will live out this kingdom message, this golden rule, treat others as you would have them treat you, the, the great reversal to love your enemy, this world would be a better place. Our political environment would be better. Christians would be unified. They would be able to come together. But it seems as though our politics are more important than our faith, than loving our enemies, than the great reversal, than the golden rule, and it can't be that way. Can't be that way. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. Being a Christian is very difficult. It's the hardest thing. You have to, you have to go against what the world says or go, maybe even go against what you really, really want to do in favor of what God has called you to do. And if you're able to do that, guess what? You are living a life that is pleasing to God. God, through his grace and mercy, has a great reward for you. In the end, it's greater than what you think. It's worth the sacrifice. I believe that too many Christians, when they get the judgment, they're going to look at down and look all the hate that they spilled out, all the curses that they spilled out, all the mistreatment that they spilled out, and they're going to look and say and have so much regret. And say, I was so stupid back then. I should have loved that individual instead of hated him. I should have prayed for that individual instead of mistreating that individual. I should have blessed that individual instead of cursed that individual. We're all going to have regrets, but don't have this one. Don't get there and look back and say, oh, gosh, Lord, I'm so sorry. It is too late. Don't go back and look back, Lord, I should have done better. Do better right now. Take, say from day on, from this day on, I am going to do better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do what God requires of me, what he expects of me. I'm going to treat others as I would want them to treat me. I'm going to love my enemy because now I know that everybody is my neighbor. My enemy is my neighbor. I am no longer confused. I am no longer misguided. I am no longer influenced by the world. I'm going to do the right thing. That's my challenge. On oh, my job, I have a boss that I don't like, I'm going to love him. I have a co-worker that talks about me, I'm going to speak well of that person. I'm going to change how I see things and how I treat people. Because Jesus was down here on the earth, mistreated, talked about, scorned, reviled. And he was really given a, a, a hint of how he was going to be treated in his ministry when he talked about it in, in, in verse 22. And yet Jesus loved. 
and yet Jesus loved his enemies. Our example is Jesus. Our example for mercy is God. Let us give kindness or do kindness to the ungrateful and evil. Let us give mercy to those who don't give mercy back. And let us love our enemies, no matter who they are. Well, I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. It's been challenging to me. I know what I'm going to do today for. I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to do it on purpose. I'm going to live the great reversal. I'm going to do what, it, what the world says. I'm going to do the opposite of what the world expects of me and what God expects of me. Then I know I'm living the life I should live. I hope that everybody has a great Sunday. I hope everybody has a great Sunday school. I will see you next week. I love you. I love you much. God bless you. Have a great day. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. God bless you.